Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, we now uh, look forward to an uh, exciting talk by Yanbing Wang. So Yanbing is a PhD student um, at Vanderbilt University, but then work and Yanbing had been involved for quite a while now in the broader theme of uh, uh, traffic flow, um, ACC's uh, systems. Um, in fact, uh, several years ago when we did the ACC experiment in uh, Arizona, Yanbing was one of the uh, key drivers of the of the experiment bring this forward and since then has worked in many aspects of adaptive cruise control systems and understanding their impact on traffic flow. Um, I see received several um, uh, awards, Dwight Eisenhower uh, award fellowship and, and other things uh, and exciting work and we're looking forward to her presentation on personalized adaptive cruise control via Gaussian process regression. Enjoy. All right, thank you, Benny, and thank you all the organizers of circles to have me here. Um, today, I'm going to talk about um, personalized adaptive cruise control. So this is a work that I've done earlier with um, when I was uh, working at Toyota as a research intern. So this is a joint work with my mentors at Toyota as well as um, my advice to Dr. Dan work. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about um, like sort of the um, literature, why and how do people use personalization to um, characterize driving styles. Uh, I'm gonna give an overview of the algorithm design in our work to sort of achieve this um, personalization. Uh, I'm going to uh, show you some little bit detail about training the validation of our model, uh, experiments results. In particular, I want to show you this really cool demonstration of human in the loop testing. Um, and finally, some conclusions. So first of all, um, why personalization? As we all know that drivers are very heterogeneous. We have very different driving styles. So in order to accurately capture um, each of us driving styles would uh, uh, help to increase our interest and trust in vehicle automation technologies. This would also improve our user experience as well as um, safety and some other aspect of um, personalized driving. Um, and in this work, we're, we're going to focus on um, specifically ACC personalization. So uh, how do we personalize the longitudinal sort of driving behaviors if there's a car in front of us? How do we going to respond to the changing of uh, speed of the leader vehicle? Um, and this is because, um, well, ACC has been one of the most commonly used level one autonomy uh, in the market today. And we also know that almost 30% of all the car accidents result in the rear end collision. So having a safe and sort of comfortable ACC can uh, help us to reduce that number. And we also know that with um, cloud computing technology, as well as the in-vehicle sensing, data collection and data storage, we can um, make this personalization of, um, very much possible. Uh, so, okay, to just give you a um, brief overview of um, personalization and how do people usually do it. So right now, if you sort of see your car, um, there will most likely be an ACC uh, implemented, adaptive cruise control implemented on your car, and you probably would have uh, three buttons to choose your headway setting. So this is one of the examples of explicit uh, personalization. So but you're basically given some choices, and you're given the predefined characteristic of how, how you choose that choice. So in this uh, case, we're looking at a headway setting. So it defines how closely or how, how comfortable that you want to follow the leader vehicles. Um, but uh, in our case, we wanted to sort of don't look at those predefined characteristics because human driving are <clears throat> some, sometimes have much subtle, <clears throat> excuse me, because human driving sometimes have much subtle um, differences, not only in terms of headway, headway setting. Uh, so we want to look into if there's any way to uh, model imp implicitly human driving behavior. So, so we're um, targeting towards a more seamless experience when we install these personalized uh, controllers on the car. So this is basically learning, uh, sort of recording and learning human uh, driving data over time and be able to update this, this model over time. And we're also looking at some of the existing algorithms um, to, that can be done to achieve personalization in driving. Um, and I mainly divide them into two categories. So one is model-based controllers. We have uh, car flowing models or the other uh, microscopic models. Another category is learning-based controllers. So neural network, Gaussian process, which I'm going to be talking about today, and also reinforcement learning, inverse reinforcement learning. So those are some of the new 
newer algorithm to bridge the gap between um, system identification as well as control. Um, and obviously we have advantages and disadvantages in both categories. So just to highlight a few, uh, model-based controllers usually have an explicit <clears throat> analytical form. So um, some of the stability and safety uh, properties can be derived, um, uh, but it's usually difficult to, um, because it, it's hard-coded formulas, so it's usually difficult to capture some other more subtle uh, personalized driving behaviors. Uh, whereas for learning-based controllers, um, it's easy to customize control objectives in, into this huge optimization function. Uh, we can achieve end-to-end -end learning and control and sometimes give us more information such as the uncertainty of our prediction, but it's more difficult to prove or maybe impossible to prove some of the properties such as safety and stability that we sometimes have really nice theories in the model-based controllers. So those are just uh, some pros and cons of each of those categories. Um, and in our work, we wanted to try our best to bridge the gap between model-based and, and uh, sort of learning-based controllers. And our research question is how to design this ACC personalized driving controllers that mimics human driving behaviors as much as possible, but also um, guarantee safety or at least have some properties that nice properties that the, the model-based controllers have. So in this work, we're going to show you a um, the design of our uh, Gaussian process personalized controller um, algorithm um, that learns the implicit longitudinal driving behaviors. Uh, we're going to show you the, val the training and validation on the Gaussian process personalized ACC on naturalistic driving data and as well as human loop testing. Uh, we have the results that show that Gaussian process can capture the driving styles of a real human much better than um, some of the benchmark ACC models that we, that we choose to compare. Okay, let me give you an overview of this personalized ACC. Uh, so we start off from uh, collecting some naturalistic human driving data. So this would include the speed, the space gap, as well as um, the leader vehicle's velocity. So this is pretty much similar to how we get the data from um, the CAN bus to, to you know, train other microscopic models. And afterwards, we're going to learn um, the driving behaviors. So this will be uh, accomplished using a Gaussian process model. And the output is going to be a desired acceleration given uh, the current state, right? And then, so this desired acceleration is going to, be, going to be filtered out using this predictive safety filter. And then so this output of this predictive safety filter is going to be a sort of like safe acceleration that guarantees safety uh, when we pass that through the vehicle dynamics. And I'm adding a, a last arrow here pointing back to the data collection because I think it's important to also to sort of close the loop and uh, uh, include human in this, uh, in this experiment as, as well to collect human feedback so that we can over time improve our model. So this part has not been implemented yet, but um, I'm just very interested in, um, in this work in general. I think it'll probably lead to the future work, uh, but I just want to point in here to complete our vision that uh, I think that th there's going to be a closed loop and then we can, you know, collect data and retrain the model, improve the model over time to achieve a better personalization. So um, let me just talk briefly about Gaussian process. Um, in this work, we're using Gaussian process, but we're not claiming that Gaussian process is, you know, better than all the other um, uh, controllers or all the other learning-based controllers. Um, so far, we have not seen people using Gaussian process directly as a controller. Uh, so it's an unexplored territory, and what we do, we're very, very interested in the potential of Gaussian process being used as a learning-based controller. Um, <clears throat> so Gaussian process is a stochastic process. So every finite collection of those random variables has a multivariate normal distribution. So as you can see uh, from the picture where this is a very simple example, where we want to find like a mapping between this one dimensional input and one dimensional output. So we want to find a relationship between input and output. Uh, so we want to find a form of F of theta. And th in this case, if we have a lot of data collected during this range of the input, we can basically find a really nice curve that pass through all the data with a very low error, right? <clears throat> and for the region that we don't have a lot of input data, 
Uh, in this case, the Gaussian process gives us a very wide uncertainty range. It basically says that um, because I don't have the data, so I'm gonna uh, have a low confidence in my prediction. Um, so the advantages of the Gaussian process model is that it's very flexible. Uh, it doesn't need any um, parameters in terms of parameters that, that, that have physical meaning. So there are some hyperparameters that gives us some abstract relationship between the input and output data. Um, it also uh, is very flexible in terms of uh, model structure choosing. So we're going to talk a little bit detail later. Um, so Gaussian process model also include uncertainty information can capture the variation of data. It requires very few data points, so it's suitable for limited uh, to learning with limited data. And also suitable for online learning because of this um, Bayesian updating properties. So we go from prior to posterior when more data becomes available. Um, but there are also some limitations. So the training time is pretty much, uh, it's a uh, cubic with, res with respect to the input, uh, the input size. So it's not scalable for large um, training with large amount of data. And as we mentioned before, some of the properties such as safety and stability can be very difficult to analyze. Um, and depending on the model structure we choose, uh, the parameter optimization process in the Gaussian process um, training uh, sometimes does not guarantee global optimal solutions. Okay, so we're looking at some of the um, background for the car forming models and how we train and validate um, our Gaussian process control controller. Um, as you have, I'm sure most of you have already familiar with this uh, car following system. So basically through decades of transportation engineering, people have been using this uh, ordinary differential equation to model um, how the follower is going to respond to the leader. So in this case, we're looking at the first derivative of the follower. So the acceleration of the follower vehicle is going to be a some function of um, the space gap, um, the, its own velocity, as well as the leader's velocity. And depending on what this model form we choose, um, the theta, which is the model parameter, is going to be different. And in the Gaussian process case, we want to mimic the same behavior. So we want to ask the same question. How does the follower, res follower respond to the leader? Um, so we're taking the same sort of input and output. Uh, so the input is going to be the space gap, the eagle and leader vehicle's velocity. And output is going to be the uh, eagle vehicle's acceleration. So basically, I'm trying to do the same thing. Can we find a model uh, form or a model structure that maps um, the data from three dimensional to one dimensional? So this becomes a very straightforward regression problem. Uh, where we have the regression vector, which is basically our input vectors that has these three quantities of each time step. And we're trying to find the corresponding acceleration at that timestamp. Um, that those, you know, those uh, input vectors correspond to. And one of the most important thing in Gaussian process model training is to define this covariance function. So this basically says um, how, well, the closer my input, my two input vectors is going to be, well, the closer my uh, corresponding output um, acceleration is going to be. So this is just assumption for training our process. And later we can see that this is not, usually not a, really valid assumption in the car following case, but, um, and then, so in this case, the covariance function, we have some hyperparameters. So the scale hyperparameters, as well as uh, um, this characteristic length scale. So all of those hyperparameters we wanted to get from um, inferring, inferring those hyperparameters from our data. Right, so the way we do that is to um, try to find uh, hyperparameters that maximize this posterior distribution. Um, so this is basically equivalent to maximizing this likelihood function if we're assuming that the prior distribution of the hyperparameter is going to be uniform. So uh, through some math tricks, we, it essentially boils down to minimizing this negative log likelihood function. So after we solve this um, minimization problem, we can find the hyperparameter parameter that describes the data the best. So after we found those hyperparameters, we can use that to make predictions. So um, this is basically uh, by skipping some details. So basically you have the hyperparameters. So you have the explicit form of the covariance function and we can calculate the covariance matrix. And using that, we can make prediction um, of our acceleration. So given any input vector 
at any time, we can know what the desired acceleration is going to be. So more visually, uh, this is going to be a very simple regression model. Uh, we are given a space gap velocity and le leader vehicle's velocity at a certain timestamp. And passing through this Gaussian process model, we get the desired acceleration at that same timestamp. And so as you probably have noticed that this is basically a very simple three to one uh, mapping. So this does not really lead to a very stable or accurate um, a solution because we're trying to not only do a regression, but also we essentially want the Gaussian process model to be a controller. So it'll be able to simulate the, uh, so simulate the trajectory. Uh, so, but in this case, the problem is that we're taking uh, all the input and output independent of time. So how do we incorporate the time information in this training? And uh, we're considering a different model structure. In this case, we're considering a nonlinear output um, error model. So the difference uh, from this one to the previous version is that instead of using the data as itself, we're using the uh, pseudo training vectors. So this is nothing but just the simulated trajectory of our space gap and the velocity. So the reason that we want to do this because we essentially want to have the Gaussian process to be a, a dynamical model. Um, so by that, we mean that acceleration at a certain time is going to influence or, or impact the, uh, our speed in the future or speed, uh, space gap in the future. So in order to incorporate that time information in here, where, um, so first of all, we're initializing a hyperparameters and some initial state, and we simulate our entire trajectory of space gap, eagle vehicles velocity into this Z hat. So this is going to be our pseudo training input. Um, and infer using that training input, another hyperparameters. So this is going to be an iterative process. Um, so we do this over and over again until the uh, inferred hyperparameters converge. And visually this looks like the following. So we have the Gaussian process model here as a dynamical model or a simulation or dynamical model. Uh, and we have a certain um, uh, state information and as well as the leader vehicle's speed at a certain time step. And then we get a desired acceleration. And using that de de desired acceleration to simulate, because this is a basically it's just a sim simple uh, Euler forward one step simulation, uh, and do this uh, sequentially to get the entire trajectory of, um, of our space gap and uh, velocity. So this in will result in a much better accuracy as compared to before, because we're taking into account of um, the time information in here. Okay, so let me show you um, our experiments. So in this experiments, we're using um, we're using this uh, Unity game engine. So this is basically a, a driving wheel as well as uh, some pedals. So we're basically driving the car in the game engine, and we can collect the naturalistic driving data. And so we're using that data to train and validate the Gaussian process model. And afterwards, we imp implement uh, this Gaussian process controller on the vehicle and just have the Gaussian process controller drive the car automatically itself. So now we have a person sitting behind the wheel to monitor the performance of that Gaussian process, um, but he or she has the liberty to you know, override or take over the uh, controller if he or she feels uncomfortable. So, and so we're, comparing the Gaussian process performance as well as two other um, ACCs to implement on the vehicles and have the person, the same person um, sitting behind the wheel and see and to record their overtime, uh, the overriding rate of, of each of those controllers. Okay, so this is what the naturalistic driving data look like when we collected using the Unity. Um, so we collected overall 200 seconds of um, data as well, so this is going to be 10 uh, hertz of frequency. So this is what the data looks like in terms of the space gap with respect to the leader you're going, in this case, it's a red vehicle in the center of the scene. Uh, we're also collecting the speed of the Eagle vehicle as well as a leader vehicle, uh, as well as the leader vehicle, uh, sorry, the Eagle vehicle's acceleration. So in this case, we're using the first about 30 seconds to warm up and the next 80 seconds for training our Gaussian process model, 
and the rest of the duration uh, of the data uh, for validation. So this is what the result looks like. Um, so at the first half of the data we use as a training. So this is basically to minimize um, our Gaussian process predicted acceleration with respect to the collected naturalistic human driving acceleration. So in this case, the uh, red the red line is a pre the prediction mean of the Gaussian process, and the red dot the so the black dots are um, our um, human driving data, human driving acceleration data. So uh, of course the training data were looking pretty good overlap between the prediction and the uh, naturalistic data because we were directly minimizing the difference between those two. And what I think is really remarkable is the validation process. So in the validation, what we're doing is basically just use the train, the Gaussian process model to directly simulate what's going on next. So the Gaussian process is given only the initial condition. So like the initial uh, speed and as well as the initial space gap um, and also the leader vehicles profile. So the red curve is going to be what the Gaussian process think that the follower should uh, respond to the leader. And the red, uh, the black dots is what the uh, human driver actually did. So as you can see that they also overlap pretty closely. Um, and we compare the Gaussian process with three other coupling models on recovering the human driving behaviors. Uh, so in this case, we compare Gaussian process with this uh, constant time headway relative loss model. So this is a model developed to uh, model uh, adaptive cruise control behaviors and Bandle optimal velocity model as well as IDM. So all of three of these models are ordinary differential equation form. And the Gaussian process here is um, purely data driven. It does not have any explicit uh, formula for it. And so in this case, we compare the sort of like the simulated um, acceleration velocity and space gap of each of those models and compare that with the actual collected data. So as you can see that the Gaussian process gives us a really low error in terms of the space gap uh, recovery. So this is a really remarkable result in my opinion that Gaussian process without considering any of those physical um, condition, the physical form of how human would behave actually gives us a really close recovery of um, the human driving behaviors. So let me just show you what it looks like uh, when it's installed in a car. So what happens here is that uh, we're installing a Gaussian process controller in the car and have a person sitting behind the wheel. So the person is not doing anything, completely hands off, feet off. So the Gaussian process is driving the car itself. Um, and of course the leader vehicle is having a very uh, random sort of high, uh, high speed high, highway driving profile and all the other surrounding vehicles are driving also randomly. Um, so now the Gaussian process basically allows the car to follow the leader vehicle uh, this, uh, similarly with what the driver would do. Uh, let me just skip forward a little bit. So in this case, the human still has the liberty to take over the controller if he feels uncomfortable and he does actually around the, right now. So you can see from this dashboard that right now the, the, the driver sort of press the brake because the car is following too closely with the leader vehicle. But that's the only case where this um, driver takes over. So at around two minutes that the driver takes over, it decreases speed because the space gap is getting too close. Um, but other than that, that's the only case where the driver feels uncomfortable. Uncom and we also uh, tested a, a different speed profile. This is a step up and down sort of a leader speed profile. And in this case, the Gaussian process model basically um, uh, allows the driver to drive very comfortably so that the person behind the wheel here does not take over the Gaussian process controller at all. So more quantitatively, we compare that to two other ACCs. And in this case, um, the, the driver sort of almost didn't take over the Gaussian process controller at all. Whereas for the other two ACC, to some different extent, uh, he takes over uh, multiple times. So this is just to show that Gaussian process in this case is very promising in terms of recovering the human driving behaviors without even explicitly considering some of the analytical um, form. So um, 
In conclusion, we're looking at how to uh, personalize uh, car following behaviors using Gaussian process. And we show that Gaussian process algorithm is very uh, promising in terms of recovering human driving behaviors and it outperforms some, some of those existing ACCs in terms of driving comfort. Um, and next step, as we can see that, as we show that in the previous uh, overview that I wanna close the loop, basically having the human feedback, the human taking over as an important feedback to improve the algorithm. Um, and so this work has been accepted to the IEEE IT, ITSC this year. So if you're looking more for more details, you can um, feel free to visit that paper when it becomes available. So yeah, that's my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Yan Bing, for the great presentation. Um, so uh, we definitely have time for questions. Um, in fact, let me start off uh, the discussion with a question from my side. So I'm wondering, um, I understood that the paradigm is that this could be implemented as an ACC that adapts to the user and then uh, reproduces how the user likes to behave. Is, is, is that the, the idea? Yes. So I'm maybe that's just a personal thing, but I fundamentally dislike something about this. Um, whenever I get tools that tools like smart tools, right? Say, hey, I observed what you did in the past and now I can replace you in doing what you did in the past because what I did in the past might actually not have made me happy. I just did it because I was used to it or something. Um, so when I get new tools, I personally want to be able to understand what they do so that I can adapt these new tools. And I noticed that when I, when I get, got cruise control the first time in the car, right, I didn't just have it on or off, uh, but I learned how to use the cruise control even when traffic was tense and uh, leave it on while I was lane changing, right, and disengaging. So I was learning the new tool. And, and when I drove several miles from Philadelphia to Nashville, I had an ACC system and also learned how to sort of when to use it, when to disengage and so on. So in other words, I adapted my driving, exploiting sort of what the adaptive cruise control system would do, but that all relies on the fact that it's a fixed system. And uh, so um, I see a lot of potential issues with having something that automatically adapts to this. Uh, is, is it just me or do you maybe share that? Yeah, absolutely. That's a really that's a really fair point. I want to say that what you mentioned is also a really general question in terms of human robot interaction in all kinds of dynamical systems. So, um, I mean, from very low level, you can choose whatever the data that you wanted to to have to have used to to train the personalized controller. So, if you don't like this course of driving, you can dis discard the type of data. And of course, this is not a forced uh, personalization way so basically i'm not saying that whatever the data that you give me i'm going to train you a personalized controller um, you have the liberty to choose whatever that you wanted to do <clears throat> so this is just a way to <clears throat> show you that it's it's possible to do this way but there are also other ways to sh to personalize your driving and your maybe there's a way to personalize lane changing like if you don't like a certain driving profile you have the liberty to to exclude that so, yeah, so just to clarify, right, my point was not on sort of this is being enforced on somebody and everybody should remain, uh, uh, have, the, have the choice of doing it, but more like that, that people do adopt it, they like the idea, but then it comes into a funny feedback loop that it develops as, as the human changes and the system adapts, right, that they co-adapt in a way that it actually dynamically leads into a, an undesirable driving state. For example, one that's unsafe, right? The key key concern is always safety, right? That you think everything is safe and then you uh, uh, cannot supervise the system properly or something, right? Or that it lures you into a false sense of safety or something. Yeah. I mean, isn't that a real concern that could arise? Yeah, I think that's that's a really fair point. I mean, in terms of safety, that's very important for all kinds of controllers. Uh, I did not talk about uh, safety here explicitly, but I did mention that I want to include guaranteeing safety as part of the objective of this personalized controller. Uh, actually, in the newest version, we have derived some kind of safety filter basically saying that whatever comes out of the Gaussian process is going to be guaranteed to lead into a safe state in the future. But that's based on a lot of assumptions. Um, and of course, human driving itself is not safe. Um, and there are a lot of other different measures for safety. So we wanted just to try our best to like um, make that a re region as narrow as possible. Um, yes. Okay. Other questions? Uh, yes, I, I have one. Um, yeah. Thanks for the great talk, Yan Bing. Um, 
I was just curious. The the mean squared error of the IDM space sideway was astronomically large. What's the the reason for this, for the unity comparison, I guess? Right. Yeah, that's a fair point. Um, the way that you know, of course, well, the way the way that we do calibration on all of those uh, carfolding models is going to be minimizing some errors, right? Uh, we search for the parameter space to minimize the error of the predicted uh, trajectory with respect to the data. And so um, empirically, we have found that if we minimize the cost on the space gap, then that's going to lead a better result than minimizing the cost on the acceleration. And because the Gaussian process is basically we're using uh, the output, the acceleration as output. So we're minimizing the cost on acceleration essentially. So I just took make it a fair comparison we minimize the cost and acceleration for all the other models as well including idm um, oh, and so, this happens to like not be great for minimizing space gap exactly i see exactly and also the data that we collected is very noisy um so that might also contribute to not having a great output from the idm calibration but yeah okay i mean that, that's the best yeah that, that's to make it fair comparison, you, you've got to do that, so. Any other quick questions? If not, let's thank Yanbing again. So imagine that people are blotting uh, the usual paradigm, yes. And we should move forward to Ken Butts now. So Ken, do you want to pull up your slides? Uh, let, let me, yeah, I'll start and stop. Oh, sorry, recording, yes, yes.